Welcome to the Deck 4 podcast. You can access episodes, companion articles, research notes and links, as well as information about our contributors and supporters at deck4podcast.com. Hope you enjoy the program. To look at the film as a whole uh, in the context of the time and perhaps with looking back with the benefit of hindsight, how do you see it as as a whole? Do you think, um, given that we now know what, what Dennis was, Dennis Sanders was trying to achieve do you think he achieved what he wanted to um he was very confident about it he told as i think i alluded to earlier he told jerry hopkins one it's going to make an absolute fortune and two it's going to change it's going to change documentaries stylistically so dennis certainly wasn't hesitant in talking it up which makes perfect sense to me i mean would have been devastating for a lot of people for dennis to have said you know what didn't quite get it this is going to be you might as well go the other way and say, look out, because Hollywood's about to change with my film. I can see him saying that. Uh, it confirms that, you know, he he thought that he nailed it. He, he got the whole sociological thing, all the different fans. It is of its time. It's definitely 1970. My neighbor, bless her, said, I've got this Elvis movie here I don't want. So, of course, I, I went over there and she handed me, that's the way it is. But it was the special edition from 2001, I think. I watched it and I was almost heartbroken because it was different from the 1970, obviously. Little nuances, little scenes weren't there. And I was sad. Of course, I've come to really appreciate that version now. I think it's excellent. But it shows you that here's a great moment in Elvis's career and life. Unfortunately, the way it was made, very 1970. Audiences is today might not grasp the majesty of the man at the time with this document. So we'll take that footage and we'll present it in a way that, that audiences can understand and you will see what we're trying to say about this man at this point. About Sanders, I have to say, and this is the one difference from the, the 01 version that hurt me in my soul, but when, when he finishes Can't Out Falling in Love, Sanders decides to shoot it from way behind the orchestra. You see in the f- immediate foreground, the band, the orchestra, you see Elvis gesturing with his arms in the air. The curtain begins to come down and the people began to begin to stand up. And I'm telling you, I'm actually fighting it back a little bit now. It is emotional because it is <clears throat> a great depiction of a triumph. And I always add in what we all know about Elvis's life and his career, uh, the kind of inherent sadness in the story and to see him at such a conquering moment with his arms in the air and the timing of all of that with the curtain coming down it is a magnificent i don't even know if sanders understood perhaps he couldn't have because of the aura of the elvis of the next seven years and the next 50 but they they his boys converge on him when the curtain is down the show is over that big towel goes around his neck And when he gestures back at the camera, there is something emotional about it, George. There's something like you were with me from the beginning. Good morning, Hollywood camera. And from there, I have conquered the world. You've been there with me. How about that? Not too bad, eh? He's gesturing that I, you know, how was that? Okay with the okay symbol. And I'm telling you, it's emotional. Yeah, I I agree with that. I think it's a really... Yeah, I agree. I actually think it's a much better film than I always thought it was. For me, it was almost a bit of a, I don't know, but not for want of a better expression, a bit of a poor relation to Elvis on tour. And it, it, it's, and I, I've sort of actually looked at it probably very differently this time and probably appreciate it a lot more than I have previously. I, I agree. Those of us that have been to Las Vegas in the last 20 or 30 years and looked around and saw you know what what it what it has become wonderful in its own way still but certainly not the the Las Vegas of mid-century that we love so much if for nothing else it's it's a great window into you know Las Vegas in the summer at at a at a big moment when a big player was in town and you know I find I always end up watching it in August around the anniversary of his death it's part of my little summer festival and it, it ties in the thing with 
Las Vegas, you know, heat, the desert, the, the way the, the city worked in terms of entertainment and Elvis. So you talk Elvis on tour, perhaps more of a straightforward concert film, aside from some of the, the older clips they use. Um, but a lot of it is just more performance. Uh, in different venues. This this gives you that Las Vegas thing. Um, and it, it gives you, you know, some of the shots, you know, the signs being put up and the show being put on in Las Vegas. So with this film, you not only get Presley in his prime, and I've come to accept that that's the way it is, is my favorite Elvis Presley album. And 69 to 70 is the pinnacle for me. So you get him in his prime, singing wonderful songs and you get the Las Vegas thing that we all like too. So yeah. And when you, when you look at it for some, for a, a podcast like this and you dig into certain little aspects, uh, it does punch things up and it makes you really appreciate it more. And yeah, I think I like it even more now than I ever did. If that's, if that's possible, I didn't think it was, but the film was actually released in November. Was that a particularly fast turnaround for, because they didn't really finish principal photography until September for that first uh, stadium show. I mean, obviously they would have perhaps been editing and um, getting things together, but it, you know, from summer to virtually uh, Thanksgiving seems to be a very quick turnaround to get the film actually in theaters. Seem pretty fast to me too, but I think great. This is what's happening now. Get it out there. I mean, I guess it was winter by that point, and you know, people are in the theater seeing it over the holidays, whatever. And maybe it gives them six months to save up for the next Vegas season, the next summer, or for the next time Elvis was going to be there. Wow, good for them. In a couple of months, they they edited the footage together. They had all the raw footage, and then it's up to the the editor that we we spoke about get it together and get it out. So good for them. It was a document of what's happening then. So that was timely. I think it's great. So number 22 at the box office didn't seem like, I mean, it got some very nice reviews. I don't think it got, there was, I don't think there was too much negativity. Um, a newspaper in Chicago essentially called it a commercial for future Las Vegas engagements, which probably would have made Colonel Parker very happy and was obviously yes, the idea. Yes. And the village voice that uh, said that uh, very hurtful thing about one of our favourite um, interviewees um, was quite com yeah. was quite complimentary as well. And Peter Gorelnik's take on the film itself is quite interesting. Viewed today, it remains in many ways a reflection of its time with, with split-screen gimmickry, a jumble of action images, and the muddled approach, not sure if this is entirely fair, but and the muddled approach to rock and roll that one might expect of a serious filmmaker down on his luck. Uh, yeah, I know. I, I've, I've struggled with this. I, I, I don't under... It, it, I guess it's so hard to analyze something with our current brains. Looking back, it's hard to analyze. Garolnik is the guy that can do it. But, you know, I don't know. For years, all I've seen is great, amazing rehearsal footage, great concert footage, good behind-the-scenes stuff. To me, it's a wonderful document it done the, the only way he knew how to do it at the time. Podcast terms and conditions can be found at our website, deck4podcast.com. You can contact us there or on our social media. Find us on the major podcasting platforms, and we're also on Substack, Facebook, Tumblr, and Instagram. This has been George Fairbrother. Thanks for listening.